Yeah, I'll start talking consistently now, and it sounds like it's going through the room at least. So that's that's a good sign. Is that is that uh, is that coming through on the live stream? Are you able to hear me? Oh, it's a little bit delayed, I guess. I keep. I guess I've already spoken, so I don't need to. There's some seats here. I think sitting on the stairs isn't terrible. Yeah, there's some seats here. You think it's making noise? Oh, nice. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for approximately the right number of you coming. I, don't, I didn't actually give you any information that would have been helpful to decide whether you should come or not, but exactly the right number of people came, or well, plus or minus a few, so thank you for that. I apologize for the room scheduling. Uh, I'm glad that the class is popular, but it's, uh, I also don't envy the role of the scheduling office right now, who are, uh, it's not just that there's, you know, classes that, are, that have big numbers or something, but it's also that if you look at the registration numbers across the classes and a, a histogram of these, or like a time plot of these numbers, they go like this, you know? And so the, the scheduling office is, has no, you know, it's a very hard prediction problem for them. Uh, and they're gonna do their very best, I hope, to get us a bigger room, um, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll roll with it as it, as it happens. Uh, so welcome to robotic manipulation. We, uh, it was important, I felt, to have in the class, I would, love, would have loved to call the class just manipulation, but I thought if somebody who doesn't know that we're doing talking about robots saw that, you know, maybe from political science or something like that, they would think of something very different. So I thought, let's qualify that a little bit. Uh, there was an early version that we called it intelligent robotic manipulation, but I didn't want, you know, some other manipulation class to come around and then it looked like a put down or something like that. So uh, robotic manipulation it is. Um, and I, I think it's gonna be a fun class. There's a lot of things. The field is alive with progress. Uh, there's more robots out there doing more cool things now than ever before. And it's just uh, an incredibly exciting place to be. So I hope to capture some of that enthusiasm for you, and uh, even today, but certainly throughout the course of the term. Let me start by introducing us. So I'm Russ. I've been here for a while teaching robotics. Um, we've got an excellent teaching staff. They happen to all sitting, be sitting together right here. So uh, Boyan's here, and Anthony is here, and Ria is here. They're our TAs for the class. Um, if there are uh, a lot of people in the class, we might get that last seat filled. We'll see. Um, the other, I would say the one most important bit of information, which is not a hard thing to remember, is that the website is at manipulation.mit.edu. Um, and I'm not giving out any handouts that have, but all of the course information, grading rubrics, collaboration policies, all of the things that I am officially giving you, I'm officially giving you with that link right there. And uh, if you have any questions or, or thoughts about that, um, you know, I'm happy to, to take those. There's an extra piece of the course. It started last year and it's continuing this year. If you're in the undergraduate version of the course, it counts as a CIM now. So um, as the department has grown uh, and now we have uh, AI and decision making as a, as a core part of the, of the department, we wanted more of the AI and decision making courses to be able to count as a CIM requirement. So natural language processing and this course have now taken on um, the ability to, to be a communications intensive in the major class. Uh, we have excellent teaching staff um, from, from CMS that are helping us with that. David's here. I, um, I think maybe Nora and Liz decided to save seats for the rest of you today. Um, 
So the way you should think about that, so it, it's, um, it looks like 15, the, the exact distinction between the two different tracks, the, the four dot, it also makes me sad, by the way. Last year we had the number 6.800, which was like, I felt like I won the lottery getting dot 800, and now we've got 4210, which is not as cool. But um, if you're in the 4210, that's the undergraduate version of the class, it counts as 15 credits. You get one extra recitation on Fridays. And I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, what comes with that, all, all the great things that come with that. Um, uh, and then if you're in 4212, you're in the graduate version of the class. So just a very, the, the detailed differences are on the website. We can answer questions. At a high level, both groups will be doing a final project. The undergraduate version will be doing a really good final project, coached by some of the best communication people we have. And um, I would say at the end of last year, the, the people that were, that were in that track had some of the best project presentations and, and uh, you know, videos and reports that I've seen ever. Uh, so if you're, I think a big part of this class actually is this product that you'll have at the end, which is a pretty, I, I, we've seen some pretty amazing videos. You should go watch some of the videos from the previous years. We had a robot playing the piano, like a concerto on, the, on a simulated piano. We've had some amazing things. And it'll look great on your portfolio, you know, your CV. And uh, I mean, industry, I had people from industry saying, oh my gosh, who did that project, right? So, um, so I, I think it really is an amazing opportunity. The recitations don't start tomorrow. They start a week from tomorrow. Before we've taught significant topics in, in um, manipulation, they're gonna, we're going to be doing in, the, in those recitations reading some research papers and just understanding the, a rhetorical analysis of how to write a good paper in manipulation. And then that will graduate into the project, uh, you know, the work towards the project. The graduate version will do also a project. The emphasis will be more on the technical and less on the communication. And the graduate version also gets a few extra problems and other things that are you know, expecting a, a higher level of maturity on the problem sets and the like. OK, so um, like I said, the, the information about the grading policy, collaboration policies, everything is on the website, <laughs> including the differences if you s scroll around. you know. It, it talks about the, the exact differences, what it counts for, what it doesn't count for. It all changed last year, so I um, completely expect uh, questions, and there might be details that we didn't get. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say about sort of logistics before we, we dive into some robots <coughs> is that I, uh, right now, you know, I'm going to say this again at the end, but just go to the website, click on the link to join the Piazza group. Uh, apart from the one email I sent on this through the registrar yesterday, we're going to do all of our communication through Piazza. Okay. Um, you can please review the course guidelines now so you're not surprised on anything later. Uh, the lecture notes are all online at, that, at the same website. Uh, the plan, the schedule's online. Uh, we're going to have weekly problem sets throughout the class, typically due on a Wednesday cadence. We'll have office hours to support that, probably Friday, Monday, and then we'll see maybe if we give one right before it's due too. Uh, the first one will be released late tonight or tomorrow. With a, it'll be a light one, just a warm up, and uh, and it'll be due next Wednesday. Okay. And then there's a lot of uh, emphasis on the final project, and they've been really, really good. In fact, I should just I'd, I'll, I'll queue up a few of the, the good ones uh, to make sure that you've all seen some of them um, from from last year. But they can be really exceptional. Okay, the course notes um, which are there. When I say read and please comment on the course notes. So this is what you get when you go to the manipulation website. It's a HTML notes. Some people hate that. They want PDF. And you can get the PDF if you want. But the HTML is, I'm trying to do more than you can do in a PDF. I'm trying to have really interactive content. There's animations that you'll be able to play. There's inter interactive simulations you'll be able to play. Uh, it's interactive in the sense that you can go in and you can comment, kind of like a Google Doc, OK? and we have discussions on there about like, I have no idea what you meant by this sentence, Russ. You know? And so I'll try to say, I, I tried to say you know, this. And, and, and people really do help the notes along and I think get to the bottom of some issues. OK, and the link to the course part of the website is right in this course being taught by uh, at MIT. OK, so I hope you, uh, you take a look at that. I hope you, you use that. And I'm happy to take feedback on it.
There's also all these links to the, to the online uh, notebooks that go along with the course. One of the cool things about it, I'm testing now my suspiciously bad connection to the MIT network, which is interfering with the Stata network, but um, one of the great things about, uh, about all the class infrastructure is that now we can allow simulations to load over the internet with no installation. Um, so it used to be that we would try to help people through, limp through sort of making all of our robot code run on your machine and people would come with a Win32 machine or like a, you know, Ubuntu 12 or something like this, right? And, and that's all gone now because there's online cloud resources that, uh, that come provisioned. Uh, we can, you just log on to DeepNote which if you've used Google Colaboratory, we used Google Colaboratory for a while, we've switched to DeepNote because it's easier to provision a stable Colab can change the requirements out from under me, and they always do it like on the first day of class, but um, uh, DeepNote, I get to provision it with a Docker image. And so you could basically be able to go to the website, instantly run the code, even the visualization, which is, loading, is not loading very well for me right here, I can, I'll run a local version, um, should all just run with no installation on any machine you've got. I'll just run a local one here. So um, it looks like this. This is the intro notebook just running locally. You'll get a little visualization just in the web. And then if you run the very first example, you'll get a little robot up here. And you can go into the, the controls. And right through the web, you can sort of drag your robot around. And uh, I'll see if I can pick up the little red brick here for us here. Be sad if I can't. It's close. A little back up. It's easier with a joystick, but it's a full physics engine. If I grab the brick, pull it up, right? I can probably even throw it if I was really good. But uh, <laughs> okay, uh, and that's just going to hopefully just work seamlessly for you. Uh, that's a long. That's a long road to get to the point where it really mostly just works. Every once in a while, the cloud services will be have an issue or something, but we've been pretty lucky with that, and pretty it works pretty darn well. Ah, see, it just loaded slowly over the MIT network, but it was there. Okay. Um, so my goals for today are to give you kind of a tour through what you're going to learn in the course, and also to give you a little bit of the um, sort of initial thinking about um, not only the components of a manipulation system that we're going to talk about from perception and planning and control, but also the way that we think about it in this class, which is a little bit different, I think, than, than uh, uh, the, your, your average manipulation uh, class. So I try to take a little bit of a systems theory perspective when it fits. And I want to make sure I, I make some of those connections for you today. But let me start about just making sure we know what I mean by manipulation. Because actually, I find a lot of people, when they hear robot manipulation, they think of fairly narrow examples of robots that are just doing pick and place, for instance. And actually, manipulation is much more than pick and place. If you take away one thing from today's lecture, I hope you'll say manipulation is more than pick and place. Okay, Matt Mason, who's one of the... the um, you know, leaders and, and uh, 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 big names in the field from Carnegie Mellon. He wrote an excellent review on robotic manipulation a few years ago. And one of the interesting things he did is he really tried to define, think deeply about what does it mean to be manipulation. Okay, and he actually gave five definitions because he couldn't decide, he couldn't narrow it down, I guess. Um, you know, the first one was, you know, just manipulation means uh, activities performed by the hands. I won't take you through all of him, all of them, but he kind of eventually got to, you know, manipulation refers to an agent's control of its environment through contact. And I like that very much, I think, through selective con uh, contact. And I think, um, I think it captures some of the, I mean, what robots are supposed to do, right? They're, what, what makes robotics special compared to, let's say, computer vision or natural language or something like this is you get to move stuff. You get to change the world. And that, I mean, you could argue, maybe I will argue, that if we're really going to solve intelligence, it seems hard to imagine solving intelligence as a passive observer of the world through cameras. I think 
being able to pick stuff up and move it around and interact with the world seems pretty essential to our natural intelligence. And, uh, and that's what this class is about, is filling in that part of the, um, of the intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, spectrum. Okay, so if I take that little example, like I just showed you, of a, of a robot moving a brick around, we can sort of um, you know, think through what that's going to look like. That's a pick and place example. But I, want you, I really want to say robot, you know, robotic manipulation is not just pick and place. This is clearly robot manipulation by Matt Mason's definition. And it's way harder than picking up a red brick and moving it to the side, right? And if you look at the rich contact that's happening between his fingers and the shoelaces, and even just the dynamics of the shoelaces, you know, robots aren't doing this yet, okay? Um, so we have grand challenges just sort of in the mechanics of manipulation. But I'll show you some examples, too, that even if the, we're doing pick and place, if we're trying to do it out in the wild, things get pretty rich and pretty complicated in other axes, too. So um, I would say that's, that's where I feel like Matt's definition doesn't completely capture the goals for the course. Matt says manipulation is about contact, and I think that, that's, of course, true. But if you think about doing manipulation not just in a in a closed environment or in a factory or something, but if you are out in the broad world and you want to send a robot out and do manipulation, then there's, there's more broad requirements that come into play. Um, I think it requires, in order to be in control of, of, you know, of the environment, that's like an arbitrary loophole in the definition where we can inject having to understand everything about the world, right? Having a very rich perceptual understanding of the environment. I don't mean putting a bounding box around uh, you know, a person. That's good. But I need to know how much mass, the, the things I'm going to, you know, what's an object, what's not an object, what happens when I push it. These are demanding things that a computer vision system doesn't typically give you out of the box. Um, this common sense of it or understanding, yeah, like what's going to happen if I push something? Am I going to topple a pile if I, not, if, I, if I push it in the bottom? You know, th these kind of things are, are grand challenges in AI. And I feel like they're part, they're under the umbrella of manipulation, okay? The ability to make very long-term plans at the task level, like what am I going to do to get the milk out of the fridge, okay? I've got to, first I've got to open the fridge, you know, then I've got to move the pickles out of the way. I'm not sure if you keep your pickles close to your milk, but you know what I mean, right? And then you reach back to the, there's a lot of steps involved to do a manipulation task, which require a pretty high-level understanding of the world and reasoning long into the future. So that's in the, in the course material, too. And then you have to, once you've decided to do that, you've got to figure out how to move your motors and your joints to make that happen, right? So combining those different levels of abstraction is a grand challenge that we try to face. So let me um, show you a, a system that exemplifies some of that. It was a project a few years ago at the Toyota Research Institute, TRI, which is just down the street. Um, I've been, I've been working with them for a number of years now to try to make some of the larger scale examples of manipulation and take them to higher levels of maturity. And this is an example that I, I learned a lot from, trying to just, let's see, if you could take a big robot, this is not something that we are advertising you put in the home, but it is a robot that we have today that works pretty well, and we asked, could that robot, if someone put it in front of their sink and asked it to load the dishwasher, could it do it? What are all the problems involved in doing that? Um, so the problem in the open world manipulation sense is someone, that's C1, he comes and he dumped whatever random things into the, into the sink. Amongst them, uh, some of them are dishes, right? Some mugs, some plates, some spoons. There's a dishwasher right next to it. And the, the task is to open up the dishwasher, you know, start putting the mugs in the top um, rack, the plates in the bottom rack, the trash off to the side, and uh, the silverware in the little silverware rack, okay? And this is a complete manipulation stack that did all of those components of perception, planning, control, um, high-level reasoning, okay? And it took a lot of work to put it all together. And then it took a lot more work to try to get it to operate at a very high level of repeatability. Like if the same challenges that autonomous driving um, companies are facing these days to try to you know, it's, it's one thing to make a car drive down the road and make a video, but to make it never crash, does it, you have to deal with all these long tails of the distribution, all the random things that could happen with the lighting conditions, with the stuff that's in the sink. 
And taking this system to a maturity was an excellent exercise that really changed my view of what are the hard problems. If you look down at the details, the, the, the individual skills that it had to do were actually fairly complicated from a control perspective, from a motion planning perspective in some cases. It had to open the dishwasher door. It would nudge things out of the corner. I mean, this is partly because it had an enormous hand and a small knife stuck in the corner, and so you can't do what a human would do, which is kind of, you know, pick it up. It had to really take different uh, tasks. To pick up the plate is a sort of my favorite one. You had to pick up a plate from a stack of plates. This big hand had to kind of, you know, go in. And this is a feedback law, which was, it was constantly monitoring its sensors to slide under until it knew that it had pushed far enough, grab the plate, pick it up and move. Each of the individual pieces of this were actually pretty sophisticated, okay? But then you had to assemble that all into this higher level um, machinery. That, by the way, um, a big part of that was using simulation. That actually, that video right there, if you can tell, that's actually a simulation, right, of the robot picking up a plate. And the way we were able to get that to a pretty high level of maturity was by having a very good match between simulation and reality that we worked very hard on and getting to the point where we could stress test in simulation, find the corner cases in simulation and expect those corner cases to start disappearing in reality. Okay, so there's been a lot of work on, on simulation. And that's a relatively new thing. To, a few years ago, I said, I said this in the text, right? A few years ago, I remember when we were doing um, humanoid robots and I was talking to my students in the lab about uh, you know, we should be doing manipulation in simulation too because it's working so well for our walking robots. And I remember, you know, they looked at me like, Russ, you can't do manipulation research in simulation. It's like, it, de it depends on perception. You can't simulate perception well enough to do that in, in simulation. You know, the dynamics of contact for like subtle things between a hand, you can't do that in simulation. Simulators aren't good enough, okay? And then it changed. It, like a few years ago, Computer graphics simulation renderers got good enough. Like you use Blender, for instance, as your renderer. It's an open source uh, rendering engine, right? And everybody was suspicious that if that if the rendering wasn't perfect, then like a, a machine learning computer vision system would would cheat, and you would it would know how to, to use the artifacts of the renderer to to solve the problem, and it wouldn't actually work in reality. But guess what? The renderers are good enough, and people train in simulation and get it to work in reality. That's changed. People now think you can train perception systems. The other big aspect of that is the physics. The physics engines were not good enough, the real-time compatible uh, physics engines. They were working for legs, which are actually relatively easier for a walking robot to simulate, but for the delicate interactions required in manipulation, they weren't good enough a few years ago, and now they're getting to be good enough. And it, there's nuances in the different simulators, but we've seen dramatic success in transferring results from simulation into reality. If you do the work to match, you'd have to make sure your models match you know, into the simulator. And all of those components had to go together into this high-level planner so that if, the, if someone came and adversarially, right, so in Boston Dynamics, they kick the robot, and that's cool. We just close the dishwasher drawer. It's not quite as cool, but it tries to make the same point, right? As if someone came and messed with your robot, it had to be smart enough to actually, in that case, it was putting a mug in the top. It had to realize, oh, someone closed the dishwasher drawer. I'm going to set the mug back down, pick it up, because I've only got one hand. That's pretty annoying, right? And then, you know, you could do it all day long and you feel bad for the robot. But um, yeah, so that was a complete system, end to end. And that's kind of the goal for the class, is to, is to help you build out a complete system and understand the different, the nuances, some of the interesting parts of the algorithms at each level of those hierarchy. Okay, so it really does go, I'd say, there's kind of a ladder of complexity in terms of high level reasoning, if you will, which involves scene understanding, being able to make sense of what objects are in the world, you know, where is the milk in the fridge, uh, deciding to move the pickles before you move, pick the milk, um, and then there's low level, like how do I you know, feel forces on my hand and decide I should do something a little bit different. And so it's very interesting to try to span that whole space. I come from the controls perspective towards this. And some of you have taken under actuated with me. So let me just sort of 
connect that to the, you know, from my view of the world. Like, why did I come from controls towards manipulation, okay? So, you know, before we were doing humanoid robots, this was the DARPA Robotics Challenge. That was an early version of the Boston Dynamics robot. It's doing backflips now. It was a lot heavier and not as backflip ready back then. But we spent a lot of time on this robot and worked very hard on the control system and very proud of, of what we did. And we, um, you know, we worked very hard on understanding the dynamics of that system, simulating that system, writing, you know, uh, understanding its robustness properties and the like. We got to the point where, you know, even when it was getting out of the car, that was the hardest part of the challenge, by the way. There was a, we had to drive this little car with this enormously big robot, and then getting out of that car was like solving a Jenga or something, or, you know, Twister to get out of the car. But we worked hard on the feedback controller, and you got to the point where even if Andres is jumping on the back of the car, the robot really didn't fall down. So we, in some sense, I think we know a lot about feedback control. Robotics has gotten pretty good at, at controlling complicated robots like that, right? Um, even perception is a big part of walking around the world, right? So we had to use our, our onboard sensors to sense the world, you know, understand it well enough that we knew what surfaces we could step on, where we could, where we should not step, right? Um, so we were solving problems like that. This was in, you know, 2015 kind of technology. It was actually right before the machine learning Boom, right? So, so this was all much more geometric perception at the time. And like a year later, we would have done it with deep learning, probably. But, um, but we had a good pipeline for perception. But none of that gets me through the sink, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting to see where that sort of dies, right? Is that the amount of understanding you have to do to understand where to walk in the world is so much less in terms of understanding perceptually the world that it really, it, did, it only scratched the surface on the really hard problems. So this is an image of a sink with mugs in it. And those points there are an estimate. We're trying to estimate, have a, this is, this is now a deep learning system that's estimating the poses of the object. And those are representing the uncertainty of the object's uh, pose, those different colors and the size of those, of those colors. And there's a, someone threw a napkin in there, right? And there's a mug underneath that napkin, and it's a pretty confused about whether that's actually a mug right now. And even just knowing that those things are separate mugs versus one, I mean, this is just a harder manipulation problem, or a perception problem. And it requires a lot more work, uh, not only in perception for the sake of perception, but the connections between perception and control. Um, <clears throat> especially, this is just an example of you know, now I have to manipulate any mug, okay? And the number of mugs you can find if someone throws them in the, you know, in the sink, they're, they're pretty diverse. So knowing how to manipulate a particular mug is not enough to understand how to manipulate all the mugs. How do you program a robot in a way that basically, you know, solves the mug problem when, you know, someone could have gone to the Disney store and came back with, like, a mug that looks like, uh, you know, one of the seven dwarfs, right? Then that, that just totally breaks a lot of our perception systems. And, uh, and we've been trying to generalize their tools to do uh, much more general, have, have a robustness in a much more general sense. I care a lot about feedback, right? We made Atlas not fall down when Andres was jumping on the car. How important is feedback in manipulation? Okay. Um, it's an open question, I would say. I mean, I, I strongly believe in the answer, but there's, there's people out there that are absolutely not thinking about feedback in, in the actual manipulation of, of the hand sort of problem. What they're doing instead is building really clever graspers, grippers, right? So this is a soft robotic hand that you can, I mean, it's just being told to squeeze, but the dynamics of the hand are such that pretty much anything you put down in front of it, it's going to make a nice conformant grasp around this and pull it over. And for some class of problems, these hands knock it out of the park, okay? But, like I said, manipulation is more than pick and place. And if you look at how humans, if you just watch yourself, you know, go home and just, when you're making dinner tonight or, watch, or, or loading the dishwasher or something, watch yourself. The, the things we do with our hands, are so, they're so hard for us to reason about. They're, so, they're, they're subconscious. But there's always these, like, right here, look at that. She missed a little bit, right, and then does this corrective action. And, and I, you know, I believe that actually we're missing out a lot by not having 
rich feedback loops connecting perception and tactile sensors to our, our, the commands we send to our, our robot. And the world is now seeing more and more success of feedback control and manipulation. And so that's, um, you know, that connects to my, my background as well. This is just another. I mean, you can watch, if you watch high-speed video of yourself doing anything with your hands, it, it's amazing what we do. You, and you don't even think about it, right? The way humans load a dishwasher is so different than the way we were having our robots load the dishwasher. They, they, you know, the robot would try to line up the plate and stick it down in the slot. Humans just go bang, bang, you know, and, and it's, you know, just rely on the fact that it kind of will fall into place. We're so clever and we're so dexterous, um, and, and robots are not getting it done that way. So <clears throat> when I think about control for manipulation, when I think about control for the humanoid, we have a problem, which is that the robot has some joints. We want those joints and maybe the center of mass to go through some trajectory, okay? And, and we know how to think about that, and we know how to build models for that, and we can build models that work even on various terrain. But when we're thinking about manipulation, it's not just about controlling the robot anymore. That's part of the problem. That's a sub-piece of the problem. But it's not just controlling the arm. The state you're trying to control is the state of the robot, but also the state of the world. In this case, the state of the red brick, okay? And that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it underactuated, for instance, okay? Um, so for me, it lights me up. I think it, to, the, to the point where I really think the next big thing that controls has to do, that's a biased opinion, but, but it, the thing that will grow controls into the next set of, of great problems, I think manipulation has a lot of those, that richness. And here's why. Um, you know, controlling the state of this red brick is sort of, I kind of know how to formulate that problem at least. Maybe it's a hard control problem because of the contact mechanics, but, but I kind of know how to write that problem down. But if I want to like chop an onion, okay? Like what's the state of the onion? If I want to simulate that, you know, is it changing every time the knife comes down? Like what, represent, what trajectory am I trying to stabilize? I don't know how to think about that. Controls really doesn't have a lot to give uh, yet in, in terms of that state representation question. Learning's starting to contribute a lot and actually learning plus controls are coming together I think to address this this grand challenge of state representation for control, right? That and once those those you know states are coming in through a camera, it opens up all kinds of interesting problems too. So we're now seeing more and more you know feedback, uh, you know, based control in manipulation. I think it can make a huge difference. It certainly makes a huge difference in the reliability of the demos. You can see, you know, in practice, the systems just feel much more real now. And the big go-ahead technology, which we'll talk a lot about when it's, when it's time, is the ability to make feedback control decisions directly from the camera. It used to be that we would kind of look at the camera, decide what to do, make a, you know, make a plan, and execute. Sense, plan, act is sort of the old way to think about it. And these are now visual motor policies where you're actually closing the loop on the feedback on the, the camera input at high rates, and that really makes the difference between a, a robot demo where the robot there's like robot air balls, right? Where you, the robot you know does something, the world changed, and it continues to do something as if the world hadn't changed, and it's really embarrassing. And uh, you know we've had robots that fall down because they just thought the valve was there and it wasn't there, um, and that's starting to change now. We're starting to be able to close the feedback loop at high rates through a perception system. This one's just, I love this particular example. <clears throat> so this is just that, like we did picking up the plate from the sink, but now it's trying to do it from rich camera-based um, real-time feedback. That's the nominal behavior, but now we're trying to make it, you know, robust to all kinds of perceptual changes. Right, and the feedback there is only from the cameras. Um, but we're getting to the point where we're, we're seeing more and more demos that, <laughs> that do what they should do in these kind of situations. Okay, but underneath that, I believe, I really believe to my core that the way you get to that is by breaking that super hard problem 
down into simple models, the same way we talk about in underactuated, if, um, for those of you that have taken it, you know, and, and breaking it down into the, the sort of the place where you can think rigorously about what's happening in the system at all the different levels. So underneath that, that technology are these, you know, relatively simplified models of physics that we can reason about, we can practice on, we can understand. <clears throat> Here's another fun example from, from TRI. We're not doing dishes anymore. We're making pizzas and the like. We'll, I'll show you more videos of those uh, throughout the term, but this is just rolling dough, another example of manipulation being a lot more than pick and place, okay? And again, it's using visual feedback. So if someone comes and throws down some more dough or whatever, um, these systems are now getting more and more robust to real-time visual feedback, changing the task. <clears throat> and this is a case where, you know, I don't really know what the state of the dough is, but I've still got to come up with a good controller that'll, that'll do the task. And these are the problems of the day. And these are the problems that I think control has to grow to address. On the, um, whoops, I put it in. Ah, oh, where did I? Okay, well, I have to find the other video. But um, there's a success video of, of the, before the interesting failure cases. Um, there's, a, there's a robot uh, uh, also at Toyota, where I've got, I've got the best videos from Toyota. Um, they, they built this, this incredible robot. It's called the TTT robot. And um, the task here is to go into a real grocery store, not just some, um, we have a mock grocery store at Toyota, but we also have a real grocery store down the street that we're collaborating with. And the task is um, not easy, obviously, to, to pick up all these objects and be robust. And actually, I'm very proud that they even let me show this video. And, you know, because uh, they think very seriously about the failure cases, and they just say, this is a hard problem. We're going to measure how often we fail, and we're going to make it better and better and better the same way. Um, <clears throat> but this robot, in the success video, uh, it, the task is, uh, Wake up, you're in the, this grocery store that you've seen before, but you're going to be told uh, some number of, of items that you've never, you know, just from a list of hundreds of items, you're going to, here, here, pick these items and put them in my grocery basket. And it drives through the store and with uh, increasingly high success rate is able to sort of go through and understand and find the objects and, and load a grocery basket, right? This kind of stuff's coming. Now that doesn't, ex that doesn't apart from the complicated failure cases I just showed, it doesn't stress as much the dynamics of a dexterous hand, but the perceptual understanding of the world is really hard in this case, right? Um, and some of the failure cases where you, you thought you could pull the object out, but it was actually in a box and the whole box tips out, right? These are really hard cases for a perception system to understand. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation at a high level. Those are the kind of things we want to cover. And now I want to tell you how we're going to cover them and what is, you know, tell you a little bit about the sort of the breakdown of the system and the, the style, the way we're going to try to connect the pieces of those manipulation systems to like to dynamics and control kind of uh, dynamical systems. <clears throat> and let me start by just saying that the, the anatomy of most manipulation systems these days uh, has ROS as a big part of it. How many people have used ROS? or know what ROS is even. I'm happy to, yeah? Okay, ROS is the robot operating system. It's probably one of the best things that happened to robotics, uh, you know, a decade ago at this point. And um, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's not an operating system in the uh, Windows or Linux sense, but it's an operating system in the, it's an ecosystem where people are contributing different modules perception systems, planning systems, simulators, for instance, and, and ROS makes it easy to connect them together. Right? So those of you that raised your hand know this, but let me just say uh, a few things about it as a launching point to what the way we're going to think about things. So um, we said that this is okay. You guys can all see that even if I'm, okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> so in ROS, uh, if I have a perception system, well, I can make, I can, I can build components in a sort of a modular approach. Okay, so maybe I have, I start off, I have a camera driver. 
Okay, and I, someone needs to write a camera driver, and that takes a bunch of work, you know, especially as cameras change or whatever. I've got some camera driver that has to talk to firmware and publish out uh, an image, let's say. It could be a red, green, blue image, for instance, coming out. Okay, there's another big chunk of work, which is to come up with a perception system. And maybe that takes RGB inputs in and outputs, in the simple case, let's say the position of my red brick. Right? In the onion, it's a much harder question, but in the red brick, I could just tell you where the red brick is, and that's pretty good. Okay. Someone else needs to write a planning system. Let's say, maybe two, maybe there's a high level planning and a low level planning, but let me just say there's some sort of planning system that takes, let's say, the, the positions of the brick and the positions of the robot, for instance, and starts putting out a joint trajectories. Okay, and then we've got some low level controller. that thinks about maybe the dynamics of the arm and tries to realize these um, joint trajectories and maybe it has to send low level motor commands. Okay, and at the other end of this, I've got a motor driver. Okay, and every one of those the re you know, maybe this one and this one are as research projects, see, but the, certainly all of these are, are massive research challenges. And, um, you know, traditionally it was very hard for one research group to do all of them well, okay? And the big thing that happened with Ross was um, it was a, it became a standard for sharing components, okay? Where maybe I could use a perception system from Carnegie Mellon and maybe a controller from from DLR in Germany, and maybe I'll just focus my research on the planning system, okay? And the way it works is it's, uh, it's, it's based on uh, message passing, network interfaces. And it's multi-process. Okay, so basically, someone can write a program here that does camera drivers, and they will just publish on a, on a, on a network, on an Ethernet, for instance, uh, in a particular type of message that contains an RGB, the data for an RGB image. Okay, and, there's, and all that we have to agree on, if I'm going to use your camera driver, is the format of that network message. Okay? And then I'll write a perception system, and maybe I'll agree to use your RGB image network packet format, okay? And I'm going to try to produce a um, position format that everybody agrees on, okay? And if we just agree on a few of the, co the common message types, and that's it, and let everybody write their own individual um, executables, right? This was the go-ahead idea that made people really start being able to share their code. And it's subtle, actually. I don't know how many um, people, you know, do a lot of software engineering, but um, it's for very, it's for somehow subtle reasons. I mean, even compiling someone else's code on your machine and having the right version of the dependency libraries all work together can be a real roadblock to trying to get, you know, some code from from CMU or something to run on my robot. Okay, by by separating out the concerns of compilation and making this executable level decomposition of the task and only agreeing on the message type where it's easy. Everybody can, whether you're using different programming languages, someone could write in Python, someone could write in C++, someone could whatever. All we have to agree on is this, the packet protocol on the network. With, with things like Docker, people don't even have to even agree on the operating system. People will run like a perception system on a Docker container on, a but, on Ubuntu 14 or whatever, and, and I can still use it on my Mac because, you know, these kind of things caused a level of modularity and abstraction that got roboticists to finally start sharing their code and really using each other's code. And a new lab 
or um, could, could start up a serious robotics project by picking the best components here. They'd get a system that would actually run and do some interesting things and then drill down and start to work on the, on the different components. That was a major good thing that happened in robotics. And just even, it started the culture of open sourcing your code. Right? Those, that wasn't a big culture beforehand. <clears throat> but um, we're not going to use ROS in the class. Uh, this is the starting place, but, but it doesn't serve my pedag pedagogical goals. Okay? So um, you can use ROS if you, if you want to, but, um, but I think the, the connections here of only talking about what are the message types is a little too weak in order to really try to take, I think even a lot of companies struggle with it. Once you, you get, it's very good for getting an initial system off the ground, but then once you start trying to take a system to really high levels of reliability or whatever, the semantics of how these systems talk together gets much more subtle. And just promising that I'm gonna publish at some, you know, whenever I wanna publish, for instance, some position of the brick, that might not be good enough. And so <clears throat> I think the field is, is you know, on the path to higher levels of maturity. Ross, Ross is growing in this direction too, okay, of trying to, to do a little bit more reasoning about not only the, the way to write these systems individually, but the way to connect them together, okay? So let me tell you about it from the perspective of dynamical systems and control. The way a control theorist might have started this, they would have drawn a very similar diagram, a block diagram, right? So maybe it starts, I'll start with the robot, because that would be more standard in controls. Maybe this is a simulation, for instance. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm taking motor commands in. and having some sensors come out, some sensor signals come out. <clears throat> now this is something that control theorists have been doing forever, right? Maybe not with um, onions, right? Or laundry or something, but, but certainly for aircraft and for chemical plants and for all kinds of rich systems, control theory has been incredibly successful. And they have a modeling abstraction, a hierarchy, a modularity approach that's very similar in the pictures I've drawn but it's different in the details, okay? So um, I'll still think of this as a block diagram, but I'm gonna be specific about the details inside here. So I typically will represent this as a dynamical system. So <clears throat> I'll write it in a generic way today, and it'll even be okay for a while. So this is a difference equation. Where X is, is used in a control sense to represent the state of the system. which maybe in the case of my, um, my robot would be the positions and velocities of the robot plus the brick. U is my command inputs. These are my motor commands coming in. X is my next state. X n plus one is my next state. Okay. And so in this setting, F has to be somehow my physics model, right? My, my physics engine here. Okay. It's somehow connecting you know, equations of motion that look like force equals mass times acceleration, okay, with this, these notions of state and the notion of next state. F acceleration is a continuous time idea, derivatives, right? And somehow I've talked about a discrete jump from one state to the next, but we'll talk about how to sort of make those, those jumps. 
Okay. <clears throat> now, these equations might be familiar to you in simpler forms, right? If you took 1803 here, or a differential, uh, you know, differential equations course, then you would have seen them first as, uh, let's say, a, a linear set of difference equations. You might have seen it that looked like this. Or the matrix form of that might be where x is a vector, right? This would be a linear difference equation. If you took an intro controls course, you would have seen something that looked like this, the state space form of a linear difference equation, okay, from controls, which would be just the, it's now a control difference equation. This would be a linear control difference equation. Okay. Now, I didn't require 1803 or DiffEQ or a linear intro controls as a prerequisite to the course. You don't, you know, if you were to take those courses, when you took those, you know, many of you have taken 1803 at least, right? You would have been able to go start from those equations and thought a lot about the time evolution of these. You could solve the differential equation given initial conditions. You could talk about its stability properties. There's lots of things you could potentially do. And we don't need all that right away for, for this class. Okay, but we, so we're not going to use, let's say, the, the deeper content from 1803, but we are going to definitely use the modeling language, okay? And you should see this f of x u as just a nonlinear generalization of these equations that you would have seen in those classes, okay? Because f is complicated, it's now a physics engine, it becomes harder to do the closed form analysis that you did in the intro classes, okay? But we're still going to benefit a lot by writing it down in this dynamical systems language. Okay, so we. We're going to talk a lot about having our block diagram of the system and using equations of this form. This is not quite enough, okay? We also need to model the sensors. So the sensors we'll typically use in the language of dynamical systems as an output of that function, of that, of that state. It could be a function of x and u in general, and y is now the outputs at time n. Okay, and in the case of my sensor being an RGB camera, right, F might have been my physics engine, but G is going to be my game engine quality rendering, right? If I have to go, go from the positions of the robot and the brick over into an RGB image, then G, it's, I can write it as a function, but down in the details, that's rendering, right? So these get to be very complicated functions. But my, what I hope to convince you over the course of the term, really, is that by thinking about it through these equations, it's going to ask you a little bit more than Ross does. I want you to, in particular, to tell me what the state is. I want you to tell me what the timing semantics are. How do I go from n to n plus 1 if my camera is running at 30 hertz and my robot simulation is running at 100 hertz and I've got events based on uh, you know, some other sensor that's, that's doing some strange things. I need a, a modeling language for talking about how those parts interact, okay? And that's going to ask more. In fact, it's going to feel annoying when you start writing these systems, and, and I, I'm not just going to say, you know, give me a function. I'm going to say, what's the state variables? You know, what's the randomness? You have to declare the randomness. There's a couple things you have to declare. But the advantage over the Ross very light touch here, for the purposes of the class, is that you get to um, do more sophisticated things with the models. 
if I only know that there's arbitrary executables behind the box and they send messages out, then there's limits to what I can say about what they do when they're connected. If I know that these systems are deterministic functions once you tell me the state, okay, then for instance, I can run exactly the same simulation twice. Anytime I just put the, the state in, I run the same, same controls through, and I'll get the same outputs back out. Deterministic simulation. It sounds crazy to me, if this, even for me to say that right there. It sounds crazy, but most people in robotics can't run the same experiment twice, even in simulation, right? It's just a weird thing, but everybody's got different processes running on different clocks and sending messages when they want to send, and nobody wrote down a specific contract saying, you must send at a certain rate, messages must arrive in a certain order. So if you see a bug in your simulator, right, you see the robot fell down in some weird way or threw a brick across the room, right, and you say, I'm gonna reproduce that, and you run it again, then your perception system might have sent a message just a little bit before or different, you know, there's, uns there's it's very hard to get a deterministic repeatable simulation out of a generically, uh, generic ecosystem like this, okay? But if you ask every one of the individual systems to declare its state, if you ask all of them to be deterministic or declare its randomness, okay, then you get an extra sort of power when you start combining them and knowing how things are gonna work. So at, very le at the very least, when you have a bug in your, in your final project, we'll be able to help, okay? Um, and in general, we're gonna try to keep things running in a single process instead of multi-process. Just keep, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to emphasize the, the interesting parts of the components and hopefully, you know, if you do a little bit of work when you de declare them, then the details of multiple message passing and all that stuff will just disappear and you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so certainly robot simulations, um, if I think of F as a physics engine and G, you can sort of imagine X is the state, U is the motor, you know, the positions and velocities, U is the motor commands, Y might be my camera image or my joint sensors. But actually, I would argue that all of the systems in our hierarchy can be described nicely with those same sets of equations, okay? So let's think about a perception system for a second. Okay, so a modern perception system, maybe it takes in an RGB image. Uh, these days, let's say it goes through a deep network and it outputs the position of the brick. Now a lot of deep learning based perception systems really just look in this case if this if the position of the brick is y and the rgb image is u they can be modeled just as a static function y of n is g of u of n so it certainly fits into the dynamical systems framework but maybe doesn't exercise the dynamical systems framework cuz the state is empty there's no state okay but that's not how we used to build perception systems, right? If you were, um, you know, if you've taken a class on state estimation, or if you've heard the terms, uh, like a Kalman filter, for instance, right? A Kalman filter will take observations in. They'll and it keeps an internal estimate of what's the state of the world, okay? Which so it's it's got a state space form and we'll output the, the estimated state. This fits squarely into the, even if it's an extended Kalman filter, it fits squarely into the modeling paradigm. And if you've worked with Kalman filters, I mean, you might, if you've done a, you know, summer at a autonomous driving startup or anything like this, or, you know, an autonomous driving company, for instance, you probably come across Kalman filters, okay? If you think about perception in this way, where the goal of a perception system 
is to summarize all of the things it's seen maybe in the recent history of the world into some coherent understanding of what's happening in the world. That's very different than what we see when you go from a single RGB image out to an estimate of the, the world. Okay? And it was actually pretty weird for a bunch of us, right? When deep learning started to work really well, everybody was talking about few shot or, or one shot learning, right? Or, or zero shot, right? And, and, and uh, you know, people were like, that's crazy. Why, why would you not use multiple images? Or like, why would you not remember what you've seen in the past when you're making your prediction? And indeed, uh, I mean, the, the you know, deep learning perception systems worked incredibly well, even from a single image, but the modern RG, you know, deep learning perception systems are actually look a little bit more like this, where they'll have a recurrent neural network in the middle or a visual transformer in the middle, okay? And those, again, the recurrent, the state of the recurrent network is gonna be, can be declared as a state in my dynamical systems framework. And transformers are a little harder to think about that way, but they totally fit in these frameworks, okay? Because really the goal of perception should be to accumulate information over time, right? Certainly the way I perceive the world is not take, it, you know, take an image and then you know, understand everything about it, right? I'm accumulating information as I, as I move through the world and summarizing it in some belief, okay? And, and so these kind of perception systems fit beautifully into the dy dynamical systems framework. If you go to think of, I mean, control absolutely fits right into that. The robot controllers, if you want to write an impedance controller or some inverse dynamics controller, that absolutely snaps right into this framework. It, was, it came from that world, okay? Planning systems are more interesting, uh, and we'll talk about them when, when the time comes, but you know, a lot of times if I'm writing a planning system in a ROS ecosystem, I'll you know, listen to the perception system, and then I'll like, go think for a little while and make no commitments whatsoever about when I'm gonna return an answer, you know, or if I will return an answer, actually, and eventually say, oh, you should do this, right? And um, you know, the timing semantics around a planning system, when these are long-running you know, planners, potentially, can be very stochastic. It can be a big source of, of uh, either conservatism, if you have to wait for your planner to come up with an answer, that's why the robots will you know, do something interesting and then wait for a little while and then do something interesting and wait for a little while. Or if you're trying to keep that system completely moving, then the semantics of when this planning system reports its answers gets pretty subtle. Okay, but when we get into the details, that still fits into these dynamical systems. You can still model that in the language of dynamical systems. Okay, so what we're gonna try to do in the class is very much keep the good things about the modular architectures but also try to declare our state variables, our randomness, our inputs and outputs, okay? And then you'll be able to compose these modular components into a big system, you know, get repeatable simulations. And if you want, you can do advanced control analysis, verification, you can do, you know, Monte Carlo analysis, but you can also try to prove that a system's gonna converge, you know, exponentially to some, some equilibrium, even if it's got some really complicated components in the way. Okay, so that's been a bit of my, you know, I would say not everybody believes this. This is my personal, uh, you know, belief, my, my taste, I guess, if you will. I think some people see the complexity of manipulation, the complexity of all these components, and say it's so complex that you, sh you can't be rigorous, right? And I'm saying instead it's so complex we must be rigorous <laughs> or we will fail. And, and people still look at me and say, yeah, good luck. <laughs> okay, but I'm gonna take you through my, my version in the class, and we're gonna, you know, I think it's, it won't be a burden, I think, if you, if you don't believe me, but you'll at least see my view of the world through the course of the class. Any questions about that at a high level? I know this is pretty high level stuff, but. So this belief that I have has taken, um, has taken life in this thing called Drake, okay, which has been a, uh, something I've been working on for a long time. It grew up in the days of controlling Atlas, the, the humanoid robot. That's when we started getting much more serious uh, here at MIT about software engineering. <clears throat> when Toyota started their research institute, Drake moved over to, also to being supported by professional software engineers. 
and grew into a, a serious project. And then, you know, now it's, um, it's being used by big companies and, um, and small companies. Lots of startups are using it. Amazon Robotics is using it for their manipulation stack. Um, so it's grown into something, something big and real. But it's, at its heart, it is a modeling language that tries to capture the complexity of manipulation in these sort of dynamical systems framework. And it has these three components, right? It, the, that's the systems framework for modeling the dynamical systems, for declaring the state variables, the, the parameters, and the like, okay? It also has uh, a really, there's some really advanced physics simulation inside it. We have some um, really, really talented uh, physics, base, physics engine uh, engineers, if you will, researchers. They've done world class in terms of the sim to real gap. I think I would, I would put Drake against any simulator out there in terms of the capabilities. And then it has a lot of tools for, for motion planning and control that are based on optimization. Okay. Um, we're going to use, I, we've made this all capable to be used in the, in the class and run on the cloud and all these things like that. So um, it's going to be the glue that puts all these pieces together. It doesn't try to be a machine learning toolbox like PyTorch is extremely good at being PyTorch. This is filling in a different part of the, of the stack, the, the dynamics, the planning and control, and they can work together. They can work with ROS, okay. Um, there's a bunch of tutorials out there. I've seen it, so in the past, people have said, I wish you had told us a, a bit more about how Drake works, especially when the projects came along, that um, you know, we did problem sets, we were successful in our problem sets, but now I wanted to do something completely different, and I didn't have you know, everything I needed to do that. So, we're going to try to balance that. I don't want to teach a class on Drake, but I want to make sure you have the resources. But we've also been pushing a lot more tutorials. <clears throat> in this evolution of the, of the open source project, um, you know, TRI made it very capable and was using it for in, in research in Toyota. And then as more companies and more people were starting to use it, they just r relatively recently have decided to, to emphasize tutorials and adoption, basically. So even if you took underactuated this past spring, you might see how much there's more documentation, there's more user-friendly stuff uh, even now than there was a few months ago. And even just the, some of the syntax that was a little gross is getting better like super fast. Even in the last two weeks, we've, we've done a lot. So, <clears throat> and there's, if you do want to use it with ROS um, or in a, uh, some other project, you're welcome to, but we'll give you a com uh, complete self-contained deep note workflow for the class. Uh, this is just an example of the of the tutorials that talk about a lot of what I just said here. There's a there's a particular modeling dynamical systems tutorial that talks exactly about how you would declare your state, your your input u. Okay, I'll just say one more thing about it here because um, we're going to need it for the first P set, which is that it turns out that if you want to you know, all the complexity of, of modeling all the different things we want to do in manipulation, uh, you don't get to stay quite as simple as that. You need to have systems that have m multiple rates, mixed, you know, um, they, they can have randomness, they can have parameters that you might want to tune with a system identification engine or a machine learning al algorithm. Okay, so, um, so it gets a little bit richer, but in the way, in one particular way it gets richer, which is that we tend to write our, all of our functions, whether it's the dynamics function or the output function, to be a function of state, of input, but also of any randomness that comes in from an input port. Okay, so this would be any random inputs. And the reason you declare your randomness is so that if I just give you one random seed, the whole thing, the whole system is completely repeatable, for instance, okay? Um, parameters, P, okay, which would be, let's say, masses or inertias or lengths of a robot, or it could be the weights of a neural network in a deep learning system. These are the parameters. Okay, and so the functions, and most functions in Drake want to be able to be a function of all of those things. So, um, Instead of passing those around as four or you know arbitrary numbers of inputs all the time, we just say let's put them all 
into a structure, okay? And we're going to call it the context, okay? And so instead of writing this, you'll see in Drake, you'll see f of context, okay? You see x of n plus 1 basically equals f of context, or sensors is g of context. When you see that, you should just realize that just means that's just the structure that contains the state, the inputs, the, the random, any random inputs and parameters. Okay, time also, time varying. Okay, so that's just a that throws people sometimes when they first see it, but it's very natural once you think about it as a dynamic as a way to write code for lots of dynamical systems. Okay, so the strategy for the lectures is to take a deep dive into, not maybe not writing drivers, but into perception. And we're going to talk about both geometric perception, thinking about point clouds, thinking about point cloud registration, how do you do um, object uh, pose estimation, for instance, in a point cloud, how do you do filtering and the like in a point cloud, in messy point clouds. <clears throat> but we're also going to do, of course, some deep learning-based perception. Uh, we're going to talk about both motion planning, level planning, and some task level planning. Okay, we're going to talk about some control. What is, how did you do force control? How would you do impedance control? If you've heard these terms, right? Or what does position control even mean? But rather than like spend the first third of the class on perception, and the next third of the class on planning, and then the next third on control, what we're going to try to do is that by chapter three, you'll have a limited but a fully functional robot that can pick up red bricks and move them around, okay, if someone tells you where the red brick is, right? And then we'll say, okay, now someone didn't tell you what the red brick is, so you gotta make a, an initial perception system, okay? And then, all right, now the scene gets really cluttered. How do you, how does, how does the system have to advance? And that requires, you know, more work from the planning system and more work from the perception system, okay? And we're gonna spiral out in this way, trying to make a more and more capable robot and only introduce the cool tools from these pipelines when they make the robot do something new and different. Okay? And one other high-level point I'd like to make is that I, I've already dropped a few terms, right? I, I just, just said visual transformers. I said Kalman filters, you know? Some of you know a lot about some of those things. Some of you don't, haven't heard those things yet, okay? So <clears throat> when I think about lecturing to such a diverse audience here and really lecturing about robotics. One of the great things about robotics is that it's a kind of a mixing, a melting pot of so many different fields, right? And it's very hard to know everything about all of them. Okay, so how do I try to do that in a lecture, right? So I, I think the best way I can do that in a lecture, I'll take feedback, of course, is um, I, try to, I try to make sure that if you know those things, if you've seen those things, I wanna be able to make connections, right? If, if connecting that to a Kalman filter, and you've thought about Kalman filters is useful, and I can say Kalman filter, then, then the people who have seen that will benefit, I think. And I don't wanna you know, avoid the word Kalman filter because we haven't talked about it yet. But I also try very hard, and you can tell me, if I, if I ever say things and you, you say, I didn't know Kalman filter, but uh, you know, I hope you still get the point, right? The point of that statement about Kalman filters and recurrent networks and transformers was that a perception system, a modern perception system, can still be described as a dynamical system, should be described as a dynamical system. And it, I want to make sure you capture that level of it at least, okay? And if you ever don't, call me on it, right? But expect, I, I try to make layers, you know, of, uh, of the class, right? So I want to be able to talk to experts. I want to be able to be, um, you know, if there's things that you haven't heard of yet, you'd write it down. Maybe that's the most important thing to go read about tonight. Maybe it's not. Okay, but you don't have to, you know, I hope you'll permit me to say some things that you haven't heard before, right? Because robotics is just so broad that you, and, and really the, maybe the field isn't mature enough to just assume that everybody has all the prerequisites so that I can say, you know, I can only build on what you've taken. Okay, let me um, finish up here. So you can, you know, when you draw these block diagrams in Drake, you can render them as diagrams and we'll, we'll do that. And you'll see that there's 
big libraries in Drake of different ways to, you know, different systems that implement these different components. Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> the schedule is completely up. I just told you the, the basic storyline is we're gonna do basic pick and place, learn basic kinematics, learn basic Jacobian-based control and the like. That's gonna get us off the ground with a basic robot. And then we'll start doing perception, but basic perception. And then we'll go back and get more cluttered scenes and we're gonna do this. It's all outlined here. There's a few lectures that I've left as to be determined and I want you guys to tell us what you're most excited about. Maybe I can fill out some things. I've got certainly got plenty of things to, that I could, could talk about there, but I'd like to hear what you guys are excited about. The projects, the, all the project-based deadlines are, are up. They're, they're aligned for the two versions of the class, but there's a few more milestones for the CIM component. Okay, so make sure you take, through, take a look through there and understand. Your goal is to hop on Piazza, make sure you're there. So if we're in a different room on Tuesday, I'll tell you that about that on Piazza, okay? Um, and your next, your problem set will be released very soon. Awesome. I'm looking forward to a good semester. I'll see you on Tuesday. I'm so sad I didn't show the successful video. Hey, how's it going? Separate to the class, I was wondering if I could ask you for a quick input on a problem I've been looking at. Okay. More to do with under-actuated. Let me, let me just yeah. make sure there's no questions.